knees in, arms. Order, arms. Right face. Join me and 
schools throughout our state in saluting our nearly 200,000 West Virginia veterans. In February, early February 1945, those on, on a ship headed to the south, when we got on the ship, they brought out a board that had the drawing on it of an island of Iwo Jima. It looked like a pork chop. The Japanese had built about 800 pillboxes. We kept trying to penetrate through those pillboxes for most of the day. And we were losing Marines very rapidly because uh, there was no cover. I had uh, six other Marines that I was responsible for. They were flamethrower demolition operators. By the 23rd of February, we'd been there for four days. Now. Those fellows have either been killed or wounded and so on. I'm the last one. So the commanding officer called all of the officers that he had left were gathered in a big shell hole. And he asked me if I thought I could do anything about knocking out some of those pill boxes. I have no idea of my reply. Somebody in the hole, the shelter, said later in a write-up that I said, I'll try. That sort of sounds like it, but uh, he assigned me four Marines, two automatic weapon people and two rifle people. And their job was to protect me firing into pillboxes as I would try to reach the pillbox. In the process of four hours, I was uh, able to knock out seven of those pillboxes. So for that, I come to the commander and four of my Marine buddies recommended that I receive the Medal of Honor. But in that four hour span of time, I lost two of those Marines. So uh, I'd always say that when I wear the medal, I, I work for that. And when we first remember, we emptied his mind, like <clears throat> And uh, it was at a night. The skies were all lit up, you know. We were scared to run to death, and uh, it was kind of chilly. How uh, chilly? Four or five blows or something like that. And then when he had to go out to guard duty that day, about 10, 15 minutes a week, stay out there. The Chinese, but I overrode the command, and uh, that's the time we lost uh, four. And 11 was wounded. I was one of them. Thank God I'm here today. I was on patrol. We'd been hit very hard in the month of February of 1969. I was up in the I Corps area, what they call the I Corps, which is the northern part of South Vietnam. And uh, we were on patrol that day, and I was walking point. And we were coming up a hill, and uh, we hit a Supposedly it was 105 that had been buried and detonated when we got to it. And uh, basically, they did that. They did that. They did that. They did that. They had so they Basically, my remembrance of it was going up into the air. Uh, later, I learned that, that day, I guess, I never did lose consciousness. I stayed away. Whole time. I can even remember the flight into the field hospital and the big lights, man. That's kind of the last I remember the lights, but I was on top of it, so it blew me straight up. Three guys behind me were killed. Well, I got wounded on March the 15th of 69, and I was released from Philadelphia Naval Hospital in November of 69. I walked out of there one Two prosthetic legs. I've been using them ever since. I'm just glad to be here with you and being able to talk. We were there at the beginning of the war and uh, we actually trained in Missouri in January to do bridging operations in, in Iraq. Our, our uh, engineer unit was lined up with uh, a couple of different elements with the 3rd Infantry Division of the Army. Uh, right on the border, we had been in Kuwait for about a month. We, we uh, finally got the call to cross and uh, we went through the farms and the show began.
it's hard to drive in the desert. Initially, that's what we were, it's just the desert. Uh, all the trucks are kicking up all the sand, so you're you know, hoping that you don't hit the vehicle next to your side bit. You didn't know what you did for a while. And the skies were orange, you couldn't see anything. And we were, we'd drive, we would stay, we would stay in the perimeter for, for uh, you know, every night. We'd dig fossils, we'd be there for a couple of days. But uh, finally, it was uh, April 6th, they told us that we thought we were going to have a bridging mission. And we were just south of the Baghdad this time. I was on the first boat truck that went down to the water. We were given the call to go, and uh, we went up there under heavy fire from the enemy and uh, our Marine Corps forces fighting on the beaches of that river. And uh, under fire, we built our bridge. It was the first bridge built uh, under fire since World War II, actually. And uh, first for, for the Marine Corps since the Korean War. Uh, we lost some Marines that day. It was a bad situation, but uh, ultimately, because of our bridges being in the water, the tank uh, the time we were able to get across the river and get into back. West Virginians have proudly
Although young, John Fisher knew that he wanted to serve his country. Born in Norwalk, Ohio on August 11, 1947, he grew up with two sisters and one brother. His high school years were spent focusing on his weekend job assembling camping trailers and making it through his classes. As soon as he turned 17, John enlisted in the Marines. He knew that they were the best fighting unit and that no other branch of the military could compare. In August of 1964, he shipped out for his training. At first, he viewed that place as a German concentration camp. Later on, John realized that there was a reason for everything that the drill sergeants did. He was trained as an infantryman and was deemed an expert marksman. The training was extensive and laborious, but he came out feeling as if he was in the best physical shape possible. After boot camp, he traveled to Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and was on a six-month <coughs> Mediterranean cruise. From there, John's military service led him to Vietnam. He spent two years serving on the front lines, encountering various enemies and obstacles. He formed a close friendship during that time. Letters were sent and received to ensure that a little piece of home remained with him while he was away. In his own words, John described his recreational time as being spent on booze and women while in service. Once his stint in Vietnam was completed, he came home to Cleveland, Ohio. On his layover in Los Angeles, he experienced his first protesters. Being in a foreign country had not allowed him to experience such individuals. It was a culture shock to see how things had changed and to witness so many people disrespecting an institution he saw honorable and important. However, on his arrival in Ohio, he was presented with a pleasant homecoming. It was good to be home and to see familiar surroundings. Although wonderful, it was slightly difficult to readjust. John was accustomed to the order and respect allotted in military life, but had to reacquaint himself to the ways of civilians. He is a member of the VFW in Richmond, Ohio, and stayed in contact with his friend Charlie. They were friends for 40 years, and their relationship ceased only because of his death. One side effect of his service would be the flashbacks he experienced soon after Vietnam. Although somewhat painful, he was able to cope. He used to hunt, but has not had the desire to since his time in the military. Helicopters and fireworks produce sounds that he is not very fond of. John has lifetime health issues due to his exposure to Agent Orange. On a positive note, the Marines made him a more rounded individual. He has learned to stand up for what he believes in and to honor his commitments. He views the experience as training to better prepare yourself to face any situation that you may encounter. Thank you. Thank you and congratulations again, Leanne. I'd like to move on to the main element of why we're here today, and that's to have a discussion and to hear the stories of our veterans here in West Virginia. So I'd like to just briefly uh, introduce our panel and ask them to come forward one by one. Uh, our panel moderator is uh, Steve Shoemake from Charleston. Uh, Steve's a veteran of the Army, was in uh, the Army from 1969 to 71 and served in Vietnam in 1970 with the 25th Infantry Division, 1st Air Cavalry Division, Long Range Reconnaissance, uh, has his combat infantry badge and three bronze stars. He's a retired uh, mining equipment sales executive and a member of the Disabled American Veterans. Steve Shumi. Uh, Larry Rice from Wharton. Uh, he's a veteran of the Navy, 1965-69, and either he liked it or they liked them, him so much that he came back from 1972 to 1979. He also served in Vietnam uh, from 66 to 68 aboard the USS Estes amphibious communication ship, uh, conducted night patrols off the coast of Vietnam, coordinated with uh, aircraft carriers and destroyers, and in 1975 it was part of the crew that readied the aircraft carrier USS Nimitz for its commission and duty. Uh, Larry has his combat action ribbon. He's a life member of the BFW, current commander of BFW Post 5578 and a member of the BFW Monitor. Fred Duty coming up from Jeffrey. Uh, as a World War II veteran, was in the Army in Europe from 1942 to 1945 with the 1134th Engineer Combat Group. He landed at Utah Beach on D-Day and also served in uh, Belgium, Germany, and Austria. Uh, he received a Purple Heart during the war. He's also a life member of the VFW, American Legion, Disabled American Veterans, and the Military Order of the Purple Heart. 
Don Cox of Beckley is a Korean War veteran, uh, served in the Marine Corps 1952 to 1956 and in Korea for 19 months. Uh, he's a member of the 5th Marines uh, tank uh, outfit and uh, served at uh, Busan and Incheon. He's a member of the Marine Corps League and the American Legion. Uh, Mike Zelker of uh, West Hamlin uh, is an Iraq War uh, veteran, served in the Army from 2003 to 2010. He was a paratrooper with the 82nd Airborne and served three tours in Iraq. Uh, he's an ammunition specialist and has his combat action ribbon and he's a member of the American Legion. So let's welcome all of our veterans and I'll turn it over to Steve. I'm going to apologize beforehand because I've got to read part of this but to summarize where I came from, what I saw, and where I am is kind of tough to do in five to seven minutes, but I'll try. When I was first asked to be here, I didn't feel worthy because there are a lot more veterans that did more and gave more than I did, but I'm going to try to tell you part of my story, which probably isn't different from many other stories. During the 60s, I grew up in a little town called Golly Bridge, about 35 miles up the river from Charleston. Went to Tech, graduated, had the world by the table. The, the thoughts and the ideas of duck and cover, <coughs> communism, Cuban Missile Crisis, Khrushchev banging his shoe on the desk at the United Nations, saying, we will bury you. All those were kind of back in the back of my mind. I was, I was ready for life. Good friend of mine was killed in a mortar attack in Vietnam. That brought the war home to me. Tried to join the Army, Navy, and Air Force, but they said I had something called a heartburn. And I thought, well, can't be too bad. Well, a few weeks later, the draft board had a doctor listen to my heartburn, and he said, no, that isn't too bad. Next thing I knew, I was drafted sent to Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and the Army decided, hey, that guy's from West Virginia, he can shoot. He'll be good for an inf infantry. So I was educated as an infantry. And after I graduated from advanced infantry training, they decided, well, wait a minute, we're losing a lot of sergeants over in Vietnam, so we're gonna put this guy in what's called non-commissioned officer cabinet school. Went through that, went to Vietnam, wet behind the ears as a staff sergeant in these six. Vietnam War, which by the way was a very unpopular war, came home, like I said, when a friend of mine was killed in a mortar attack. I was trained to be an infantryman. Now my sole purpose in life was to destroy the enemy, lead and protect my fellow soldiers, and live to fight another day. The Army said they had trained me for just about every imaginable event that could occur. I was ready. So off to Vietnam, and in only 365 days, I'd be back home. Piece of cake. No sooner had I stepped off the plane that reality hit and I knew I was not ready for what lay before me. Boy, was I ever in for the surprise of my life. When I arrived in Nam, I was shuffled into a battalion commander suit, and he informed me that I'd been selected to be a team leader for long range reconnaissance patrols, LERPs. Primary mission of the LERP team was intelligence. A six man team usually dropped by helicopter into enemy territory. Conducted reconnaissance, set up ambushes, or secured a landing zone for more troops to be deployed. All of a sudden, I was not only responsible for myself, but now I had the lives of others in my hands. Those men, and possibly many more, depended on how well I knew and did my job. No training prepared me for this. Just imagine being dropped in the middle of nowhere 
and having to slowly and carefully feel your way through a jungle with the possibility of running into a booby trap or an enemy soldier at every turn. What chance would six men have if they encountered a large enemy force? I've got a hard time remembering the guys' names, but I can still see their faces. I didn't really want to know them all that well because there was always that chance they may not be alive tomorrow. If I distanced myself from them, it wouldn't affect my decisions on putting them in harm's way or hurt so bad if they were gone. While there, I had to make some pretty tough calls, and some of them I regret as of this day. A person who has never been in war will never understand what any soldier sees, hears, feels, smells, tastes, hates, loves, and fears. I was trained to kill without blinking an eye, and now that target had a face. I saw the faces of the enemy, as well as the faces of fellow soldiers, old men, women, and children. They were either cold in death, or else numbingly blank with months or years of death and destruction. To see the true realities of war, as well as being part of man's inhumanity to man, changes a person forever. Over 36,500 West Virginia men and women served in Vietnam, and of that number, over 1,182 gave the ultimate sacrifice. Little known is the fact that nine West Virginia servicemen received the Congressional Medal of Honor for their service in Nam. There has been and will be great debate on whether the war was worth the sacrifice. It's much like the going debate right now about Iraq and Afghanistan. Sometimes we all go by the old saying, out of sight, out of mind. But what we may choose to ignore still exists. Human beings still live under practices of genocide, tyranny, and are shot or jailed for seeking liberty. I believe it is our duty and our obligation to truly help those in need and if mortal combat is required, so be it. The mind is a wonderful thing because it often tends to try to forget the bad and just remember the good. For many old as well as young soldiers, it doesn't always work. Those bad memories come back again and again, and many find them hard to live with. Telling you that, I can also tell you that if the call comes again, the soldier, young or old, will answer. Just so you understand, I will always be a soldier. I will stand at attention. See, I get, I get hung up on this. I will always stand at attention during the playing of the national anthem, and I will get a little flutter when I see old glory. To me, the American flag does not represent Republicans or Democrats or congressmen or senators or even the president. It symbolizes a republic that truly believes in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all. More importantly, it represents the sacrifices given by so many wonderful men and women to enable you to be sitting here today. God bless America. All right.
I graduated from Scott High School in 1964. I left, went to Cleveland, Ohio, stayed there for a year. Got a draft notice. He wanted me in the Army. I was supposed to have been inducted in the Army in 65, that month of September of 65 in Bakley. At the time, Vietnam was getting pretty hot. A lot of boys were dying. I decided I'm not going to be one of them. So I called a Navy recruiter. At the same time, there was five of us who graduated together, got our draft notices. Out of the five, guess who went to Vietnam? The rest of them stayed in the United States. One went to Korea. Six months from the day I went in, I was sitting in Da Nang Harbor. I don't regret it. I would do it again in a moment. As Steve said, a soldier is always a soldier, no matter what. Even if you're a Marine, Army, Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard. We all had one purpose and one purpose in mind. That was to serve the United States of America. No matter how hard it gets sometimes, we still look back and see young men who died. Out of my graduating class at Scott High School, I think it was about three. The following year, 1965, I think it was another eight. They gave the supreme sacrifice. As time went on, I came home, I got married, and like a lot of the other vets, I got a divorce. It wasn't her fault, it was mine. I thought everybody was wrong and I was right. What it was, I was wrong and everybody else was right. Vietnam had changed me. It changed a lot of men. Boys went over 18, 19, 20 years old. When they came back to the United States, they were old men. They had, their hearts had hardened. Like Steve said, you don't get to be friends with no one over there. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, they might be gone. I served till 1969 and I got out. I stayed out a while. Then I went back in the Navy. <clears throat> when I went back in, I went into California and they gave me orders to uh, Norfolk, Virginia. I helped put one of the largest aircraft carriers in the United States into commission, which was the USS Nimitz. The, air, the uh, flight deck on the Nimitz was three and a half football fields long. We had a, a crew of 6,500 men. It was a floating city. From there, I left, went to another ship, which was called the USS Vulcan. It was a destroyer tender, it repaired ships and such. I trained on it as a locksmith. My, I left from there and I went to another ship called the USS Orion, which was a nuclear sub-tender. They sent me to 32 weeks of welding school in San Diego, California. I came back and I welded on nuclear reactors in the hulls of the large submarines. <coughs> you know, all the things were not always good on things, on the ships. But I don't think any of us that are military 
really remember the bad times as much as we do the good times. We try to put the good times in respect to the bad times we served. I stood on board the ship in Vietnam. I could see the napalm drop. I could see the shells from the other ships hit the beaches. But I was never in the situation that I had to actually point a gun at someone. I run up and down the rivers on a, what they called a, a swift boat. It wasn't too big, about, eight, about 21 foot long. But at times, you can see the tracers coming back at you. There's always a little green dot coming around. But Vietnam and the Navy made me more of a person than anything. When I left, I was 19 years old. Didn't know a thing about the other side of the world. But like I was telling my granddaughter last night, she was asking, I like a lot of other ones about the veterans. She said, Papa, where you been? Where was you at when you was in the service? I started telling her. I went from San Diego to Hawaii, from Hawaii to Okinawa, from Okinawa to the Philippines, from the Philippines to Vietnam. From Vietnam, we'd take R&R &R and go to Hong Kong. We took R&R and, &R and went to Singapore. We took R&R and, &R and went to Japan. I was put in places that I never knew existed as a boy at Ottawa, West Virginia, in Boone County. Never thought I'd ever see something like that. The military gave me that chance. Also, when I came to the East Coast, I was serving on the Nimitz. We went to Germany, Japan, or Germany and England, Scotland, and a few other places. But I think if the young people today, if you've got your mind made up on serving the military, it is one of the best things that you could ever do. Thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce Fred Duty to you. Fred was in World War II, landed in Utah Beach. He said I was World War II. I can't help if I look that young. <laughs> Maybe that helped me. I was one of the lucky ones in the service. I was at a headquarters, headquarters company. It wasn't a company, it was a group headquarters. We received orders from 3rd Army headquarters and handed them down to the battalions that were underneath us. But to back up, before I started from, I was a farm boy. I just come out of high school and I received my invitation to join the, all, all of the other troops. I gladly did. I had never been any farther away from home than Putnam County. But when I took my examination, they let me come back home seven days. They called me back. They put me on a train to Charleston, West Virginia and took me to Fort Thomas, Kentucky. Lord, that was a long ride. When I got there, they loaded me on another train and took me still further. Camp Carson, Colorado, about 90 miles east of Denver. That's where I took my basic train. I learned how to obey. I learned how to persevere. I learned how to do what I was told to do. I ended up one of the best in the class. I was given a promotion, and the time came when there was a cadre to be formed. The tech sergeant above me, he selected me to go on the cadre. We went from there to Camp Maxi, Texas. There we formed a new company, brought in all new recruits. 
And I love those boys because I can tell them what they're doing. But you know what? That ended up to be a band of brothers. We went overseas together, came home with some of them. They split us up and put them all in different places to get us home. But I still communicate with the ones that are left. So it's been a long journey. During the time I was over there, it took us seven days to get from the United States over to Glasgow, Scotland. We landed in Firth of Clyde. From there we went to Southampton. Southampton we crossed the channel into France. First night there, we slept in an apple orchard. All night long, there was tanks going by. You couldn't sleep, but clickety-click, clickety-click. And you'd wake you up if you didn't go to sleep. We worked our way all the way on inland toward Nancy, France, different cities on from where we were at. Ended up, back in the way short, I was in the calling for to take a convoy of boats to lead them into a river crossing on the Rhine River. Sometimes I'd get ahead of them and have to go back, baby them out, get them started again. Sometimes the road was too narrow for the boats and it knocked the corner off of a house and come on. After we got there, we found out they didn't need them. The Germans had to relinquished the other side and then moved on. And they were able to get their belly bridge across the river without any problems. But I had a problem. I, I smelled a cup of coffee. And I went over to a little shack that was there that was coffee making. I was waiting my turn. There was a German out there somewhere that had an 88mm gun. And he placed a shell right in the middle of that building. That's a quick demolition. I was wounded, so I came back over to where I was, had come from there at a foxhole. I came in a hurry, and as I dived into the foxhole, another shell exploded right over top of me. There was three inch wood on top of that foxhole. I looked up, and there was a big piece of shrapnel pointed right down at me. I, did, I began to think I didn't like me. So I stayed in the hole a little longer. I wasn't bleeding too bad, so I thought, well, I'm going to make it okay. And from there on, we kept moving up. We got up to Munich, Germany. and went a little bit farther than that after that. I never made it to Berlin. But I learned a lot while I was in the service. I'm still a soldier. I'm still going strong. And I lost something that was most precious to me. I lost my brother over there. He was my best friend at home. And out of the others, we were together more than I was with any of them. But I learned to live through it. I learned to keep the memories in my mind of the times that we had. And I learned to say to, to myself, he gave his all, and I came close. But we must never give up. There has been too many wars in this world. Too many are going on right now. If they could see the things that could happen in the time of war, they would change their mind. I saw many displaced persons while I was over there. One day I was traveling in a jeep, and there was a tractor trailer in front of me. It was loaded with displaced persons. He went around the curb, and as he went, all of the weight went to one side of the trailer, and it turned over. Those people, some of them were hurt, some of them were so anxious to get back home. We were trying to do them a favor, but yet, by accident, we heard them again. 
So remember, everybody in your prayers, and I've been on that for one so long, and I've made it back, that they will never have to go back again. Thank you very much. Well, earlier I said a soldier is always a soldier. Well, that's an understatement when you say a Marine is always a Marine. So it's Don Cox's turn. So.
supplies that they needed for each place that they were. And there was quite a few times that we'd go somewhere and uh, supposed to be there for a day or, or two, and we'd get there and they'd turn the uh, red light on on us and there'd be a dust storm come in and we'd sit there for four or five days before we could go back to our original camp or go to the next one to train them. And uh, I guess another big difference in it is the tactics that they use on the uh, World War One and Two, Korea, and all that. There was a lot of face-to-face -face fighting. You know, they could look at you, aim their weapon at you, and fire. And then you had the opportunity to see them a lot of times and fire back. Well, Iraq's different. They uh, they like to hide and uh, use things called IEDs, which is just a, a bomb they plant beside the road. When I first went over there in 2004, we didn't have the up armor Humvees and uh, all the uh, armored vehicles. We were driving around in soft shell Humvees and LMTVs and things. And uh, that's when we, right after they started using the IEDs against us. And uh, we lost quite a few people because we weren't prepared for it. We finally got up armored Humvees after we improvised and put metal plates along the sides of them and tried to just sandbag the floors and stuff. We finally got the uh, luxury of having uh, up armored Humvees. And then they started using uh, a different style of IED, my second appointment, which was they were hanging them up above under underpasses and stuff, trying to knock them. Instead of coming from the side or underneath the vehicle, they were trying to come from the top and take out the gunners. And uh, then they started using an accelerant with them that would, when the IED would go off, it actually burn. And uh, there was a mission we were on, uh, taking supplies to uh, another fob. And uh, the supplies were water, mail, fuel, stuff like that. And uh, the, f the first time I remember any, uh, even hearing of it was, the f was this time that I'm talking about now. With, uh, the accelerant was there was a uh, integrated convoy. We had civilian contractors driving their vehicles, the big semis. And the only thing armored on them were the cabs of the truck. And uh, we were going up the main supply route and was passing into to crit and one went off and uh, burnt a uh, Humvee in front of me and the uh, semi in front of him and uh, five guys in the Humvee burned to death. And then after that they decided to uh, have us wear these retarded suits that uh, were like astronaut suits. And uh, it had its own cooling system and everything. And then they tried it out, and the unit, my unit, was uh, one of the, I don't know, five uh, units that were designated to try these things out. And we quickly found out that it was a bad idea because the gunners couldn't move around in the, uh, in the turret. And if anything would happen, we'd have to evacuate the vehicle. A lot of people were getting snagged and everything else, so they decided that was a bad idea and went from it to uh, just fire retardant jumpsuits. And I guess now that's still what they're doing. Uh, basically, I guess over the period of time between all these wars, we've been lucky enough to have uh, researchers and advances in the way people think and we're moving forward in ways to defend ourselves from different types of attacks and different enemies. Uh, one thing that the Iraq war has been able to teach us is PTSD and uh, TBIs, traumatic brain injuries and stuff like that that the soldiers are bringing home with them is causing problems in their everyday life and advances in medicine and everything else. They've just been able to identify these things and kind of help us out with them. Uh, 
I'm uh, I'm proud to have done what I've done, and uh, I don't feel that I still don't feel I've done enough. Um, I know a lot of older veterans that have seen a lot more and done a lot more, I believe. But uh, it's something that I, I am proud of doing, and I'll gladly do again. And I think if you do have the opportunity to serve your country, that it's something that most people won't pass up. You think about it beforehand, you think that uh, you got a gut, gut wrenching, wrenching fear in you that you don't want to die or whatever. But I think when the time comes, a lot of people just say uh, it's probably the best thing to do when they do it. But I made it through, uh, through three tours to Iraq and I'm home now. I'm glad to be. Thanks. Before I turn it back over to Colonel Plumley, a request. If you know a Vietnam veteran, say welcome home. If you see someone in uniform, just say thank you for your service. It goes a long, long way. Guys, at this time, uh, I want to open it up to the floor for people to have questions, either for an individual or just a question for anybody, everybody on the group uh, that may want to ask. Uh, one of the things that if you didn't pick up on it is for our youth students, most veterans are happy with what they've done, they did what their job was, they came home and they're happy to be back home. Uh, some folks will talk about what they've done, and some people done lots of good things. Everybody did something and made a difference, but we all had a job and we did it. Okay? And we all were glad to come home. At this time, do I have anybody that has a question for anybody in the group? If you do, please stand up so everyone in the class or the auditorium can hear you. Veterans, you're more than welcome to ask a guest in a specific form as well.
Well, since I've gone to PTSD groups, I can answer that. Most of the Vietnam veterans that, that I know and that I've, I've been in group sessions with, um, they've, they're, they're still lost. They, the anger that they hold and carry uh, is unimaginable. Uh, we're, we're told we go into caves. Uh, we can't show hurt or so, so we try to hide it with, with the big tough guy face. And we go into our caves. And uh, what, what I've told you all today, uh, I couldn't have told you up until about three years ago. That what, I, what I went through, what I saw, I carried. And uh, it's the tough guy syndrome. You, you can't let it out. If you, if you show the hurt, the anger, the fear, you show weakness. Soldier, soldier was always taught, don't show weakness. But we're human beings. And once you, once a soldier with PTSD can, can get those feelings out, that's, that's a way to a cure. He, he's on the road to recovery. Steve was talking about PTSD. A lot of the Vietnam vets come back, and to this day, they're still fighting that war. A good friend of mine about two years ago, he was a minister. He'd been in Vietnam. He was having flashbacks, really having a bad time. He took his life all because of PTSD. I'm like Steve, it's, it's been about three years ago before I ever opened up and started talking about the Vietnam that I had. I was on a ship, I could stand on the deck of the ship and I could see the napalm like I said it drop. It has an effect on you that you'll never forget. Yes, PTSD does exist. It's a post-stress traumatic syndrome. It's things that you see and go through, things you hear. And if you see somebody at, at these fireworks and things, I won't go to them. They'll jump, they'll flinch. And it's probably because of PTSD. As I said a while ago, I was one of the lucky ones. I carried a gun. I carried a carbine for a while. And then they issued me a submachine gun. I never had to use it, simply because I was in behind the lines and on the friendly side. But I have seen enough of the things that these two fellows have talked about know that it is real. If they suffer, not only then, but suffer today. It didn't bother me because I got injured. I let it go with that. I wasn't injured enough to cause me to have any debilitating problem. But I could have been killed. And that's the part that gets up here. And you can't get it out. You have to work on it. And sometimes it doesn't come out. But I thank God that I was able to come out, come home, live a good life, raise the family, and I gave my all to my country. Well, most of us, when we come back for the first year or two, I mean, we were wild. They called it different things, but most of it was just ignorance that you do. And I mean, the VA has psychiatrists. I mean, I've been out of service for over 50 years, and I had to see one. But they said I should have seen one years ago. 
the way it is. If you need help on anything, go to the VA or VA representative. They'll help you. I know uh, a lot of guys that suffer from PTSD that are real good friends of mine. I still do talk to them. Uh, one of the problems with it is, is they do do tests on you when uh, your tour is over. And, uh, they can kind of tell you whether you have it or not. But the problem is, is like he said, uh, the tough guy exterior, you know, you have to go talk to someone, and a lot of guys don't do it. And that's, that's probably what the biggest problem is, is not using what the VA offers for all the veterans out there. But they do have programs to help, and you can go to the VA and talk to someone, they can help you out with group, group sessions and everything. We have time for one final question. Yes, sir. World War II veterans, you have to be on the Hero Jima when you drop the ball and drop the Nagasaki. Were you in, on the Hero Jima when they dropped the ball on the Nagasaki? No, I was in the European theater. Oh, okay. I was waiting for a boat to bring, bring me home. And the long short one were on strike in the United States and they couldn't get a boat. But thank God the war was over on both directions.
thank everybody for coming, for our panel, for sharing with us through your story. Uh, one of the things we had the kids do was an essay, and one of the stories that was written, his opening comment was, when you talk to a veteran, it's like talk, opening up a history book. You start learning stuff when you start talking to them. And I thought that was so neat. But so again, thank you, gentlemen, for sharing your story with us. Please, at this time, join us in the comments area for snacks, and thank you for coming.